share this PowerPoint over here. Um, So we see notes view right now. Yeah, let me, I hate when that does that. So let it happens me, to me all the time. Let me switch. It. I'm gonna oh, I'm gonna stop sharing. All right, and then I'm going to share again. I'm gonna say this time I'm gonna share screen two, and hopefully that will. When I start PowerPoint, that will fix it. Yes. Okay. I see it now. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for for showing up today. Again, as Sam said, my name is Rob Owens. I am the ITC for the Bryan School of Business and Economics. And so we're just going to have two quick agenda items today because I know we don't have a lot of time. The first thing um, we're going to do is define inclusive teaching and inclusive teaching practices. I put a link in the chat. So if you have time right now, go ahead and click on that link and download the uh, inclusive teaching strategies reflecting on your practice worksheet because we'll be talking a little bit about that here in a second. The second thing we're going to do using that inclusive teaching strategies worksheet is explore the various ways that we can engage in uh, inclusive teaching practices one of the things I like to do when I'm um, doing these types of webinars, I'm more of a facilitator, so I will be asking questions and, you know, including your voices in this presentation today, if you want that. Like I know that a lot of us are probably already uh, practicing some level of inclusive teaching in our work. So again, um, that's me. Another thing that you may not know about me, though, is that, you know, inclusive teaching has is really at the core of, of who I am when I uh, went to do my doctorate in actually kinesiology um, within sp uh, sports studies and sports psychology. You know, my dissertation research uh, back in 2007 to 2011 was related to anti-oppressive education. I drew a lot from the work of Kevin Kumoshero, who wrote a lot about common sense knowledge and how common sense knowledge is constructed, particularly within K through 12 curriculums. Uh, Kumashiro was a uh, high school math teacher. Uh, he's also Asian, uh, Asian American, who's also identified as queer. And so he wrote a lot about his experiences and when it came to teaching and learning and how students would bring in certain ideas with them in the classroom that if that could sometimes go unchallenged unless we ask them about, you know, their, unless, unless we ask them about those ideas, right? So he talked about this notion of uh, the hidden curriculum, you know, things that you don't know that your students are thinking, right? And so in order for us to know those things, we have to ask them. So that's kind of started my kind of venture into anti-oppressive uh, teaching and, and what I'm now calling inclusive teaching practices. You know, I've done a lot of volunteer work um, related to my discipline and sports psychology. You can see it here. I'm not going to go um, through all of that, but this just gives you an idea of why I am very interested in this topic. I'm also, if you haven't taken the Clifton Strengths Inventory yet, I'm going to talk about that later and the importance, I think, of understanding and knowing yourself when it comes to inclusive teaching. I am, uh, my top strengths are context, includer, deliberative, relator, and arranger. And I'll talk about that more here in a second. So the question is, what is inclusive teaching? Again, I like to include the participants in the workshop. So you don't have to unmute your mic, but if you can take a minute, what does inclusive teaching mean to you? Throw that in the chat, uh, and then we'll, we'll continue from there. So take a minute or so. Think about inclusive teaching, what it means to you, and throw that in the chat. Okay. Yeah, okay. From Sam, Universal Design for Learning. We're going to actually talk a little bit about universal design for those of you who do not know representation and what you teach with equity and how we treat our students. Yes. 
what else? Ah, yes, UDL is, is my passion. Yes, thank you, Sam. Okay, yeah, Audrey. Yeah, so since the uh, instructional designers, we kind of have to love UDL or there's probably something wrong with us, right? <laughs> to a certain extent, because it's all about <laughs> um, inclusion and, and like drawing on just accommodating our students' various strengths, right? And how do we and how do we do that, right? So as you're thinking about that, I can see, I know we're, we're short on time here. I would usually give a little bit more time to answer these questions. Oh, okay, we'll have one coming in from Dr. Horton. Teaching that develops a community in which everyone feels that they are part of creating it. And I think, yeah, Dr. Horton, I think that's a really important point because I really like this, what really resonates for me is this notion of community when it comes to inclusive teaching practices. We are creating communities when we engage in inclusive teaching practices, supporting belonging for students of all kinds of identities. Yes, belonging is really important because there's a difference. And even though we're calling this inclusive teaching, I will um, note that there is a difference between inclusion and belonging, right? We can try to include or welcome people in but if they don't feel invited, you know, there, there's that sense of that they don't feel like as if they belong. So it's important when we're thinking about inclusive teaching, we're also thinking about it from the point of our students and whether or not they feel that they do belong um, in, the, in, the, in the academic communities that we, that we create for them and that they, where they engage with, with us. So, yep, Inclusive teaching means creating a nurturing environment where students feel comfortable exploring topics. Yes, all of that is, is great and wonderful. And I know we're short on time, so I'm gonna continue on, but thank you everyone for, for adding in those comments. And we're gonna come back to ideas of belonging and inclusion and community as we go through this webinar today. So in terms of a definition, I don't like to recreate the wheel um, and so I'm just, I took a definition for inclusive teaching from um, Yale's Teaching and Learning Center. And so we're talking about inclusive teaching first, a pedagogy that strives to serve the needs of all students, regardless of background or identity, and support their engagement with subject material, uh, hearing diverse perspectives, uh, and rich, kind of rich student learning by exposing everyone to stimulating discussion expanding approaches to traditional and contemporary issues and situating learning within a student's own context, right? You know, I'm gonna come into that context thing too, because that's, for me, context is very important. It was my number one when it came to Clifton Strengths was context. Their own context while exploring those contexts. Students are more motivated to take control of their learning and classroom climates that recognize them, draw relevant connections to their lives in response to their unique concerns. So it's just like everyone was putting in a check. Inclusive teaching is really about bringing students in, uh, attending to their diverse perspectives, uh, situating things within or learning within within particular contexts, creating belonging and, and, um, and, and community. And so another way that I like to, to to think about inclusive teaching. And I'm drawing this more from a multicultural psychology. When I was working on my doctorate in sport and exercise, well, kinesiology with the emphasis in sport and exercise psychology, uh, we talked a lot about multicultural psychology. Um, Dr. Diane Gill was my um, supervisor. And so in her, her area of expertise is gender within sport psychology. And so we talked a lot about multicultural um, issues as it related to sport, physical activity, and, and the moving body. And so in terms of multicultural psychology, another way for us to think about this as educators is that we need to be aware of how our cultural backgrounds, experiences, and practices influence our teaching practices. So that level of cultural awareness, not only of ourselves, but also of our students and the, the backgrounds that they're bringing into the classroom. Um, we as educators need to recognize our limits of competency and expertise. Like, you know, where are our blind spots? That's really important. We need to have that self-awareness in order to be effective um, educators when it comes to trying to be inclusive with our students. 
And then we need to be comfortable uh, with the differences that exist between ourselves and our students based on issues like race, class, ethnicity, and culture, but also based on other issues like learning styles and, and neurology, right? There's just like, you know, people, there are people who, who are neurodiverse. And so it's important for us in thinking about particularly universal design for learning, how can we accommodate um, students of various backgrounds and not just say race, gender, uh, sex, sexual orientation, sexual, excuse me, sexual orientation, not sex. Uh, we'll focus on gender when we're talking about that. Um, and then, you know, how can we also accommodate students that have other, that, and, that live in other types of identities based on um, their maybe physical ability or, or mental ability? How do we accommodate all those things? And so the, there are two main strategies in looking at that. One is that we want to incorporate diverse perspectives into our course content. Like I said, if you have downloaded the Inclusive Teaching Strategies worksheet, um, that's one of the areas where, where we're gonna, what we're gonna talk about and explore a little bit more. And we also need to create an inclusive classroom climate where all students are encouraged to participate. And we want to invite in their various um, identities into the classroom because it's what Kevin Kumashiro, Dr. Kumashiro would say, it's like when we don't do that, um, it can create problems because we may be, uh, we may be, we might be causing harm when we don't invite those things. And because we don't really know who we're talking to, we really don't know who's in the room unless we invite students to share uh, those things about themselves that make them different and uh, embrace all of those things about our students that make them unique and uh, wanting to belong. So this is, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but uh, I just took the Clifton Strengths inventory a couple of weeks ago. You can actually, University Teaching and Learning Commons will give you access to this inventory. You can take it and then they'll provide you with a free coaching session around it. I, I included this particular because a couple of seconds ago, I was talking about the importance of self-awareness, right? That's part of uh, becoming a an educator who who kind of draws from inclusive teaching who who wants to be as educators when we want to be inclusive so with my clifton strengths is like my top one is context i'm appreciative of the past uh, i'm an includer so i'm aware of exclusion and what it means and its uh, repercussions i'm deliberative that i am a vigilant observer of potential risk it also means that i like to consider options, lots of options before coming to any type of decision. Uh, relator, I'm genuine and authentic and I like to bring people in. And then I'm a ranger, I'm comfortable with lots of moving parts. And so for me, as a person who believes in inclusive teaching, it kind of makes sense because I do like to include, I do like to, to relate to others. I am comfortable with being uncomfortable at times and when there's lots of moving parts and lots of different things going on. And so, but the, our strengths can also, we can overuse them, right? So when I'm thinking about my, uh, when I'm thinking about inclusive teaching, for me, I'm thinking like, oh yeah, I'm very multicultural. I like to bring in everyone's voice. But given that there are power dynamics within the classroom, there may be times when I need to leverage certain voices in my teaching and maybe excluding others at least temporarily. So that's something that I have to be aware of because I am the type of person I do like to include, include, include. It's like, when do I need to exclude? When do I need to elevate or amplify uh, a student's voice or a student's or, or particular student's identities when, when, I'm, when I'm teaching? So, Getting into the to guidelines for practice, there are again. This is coming from from Yale's Teaching and Learning Center, so it's 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 not new. But we want to consider teaching and learning frameworks when we're thinking about bringing being becoming more inclusive educators or like using inclusive teaching practices. We want to maintain awareness of classroom diversity. 
We want to make sure we include, include diversity within the curriculum. Uh, we want to cultivate that inclusive comment. We want to consider universal design principles. We want to solicit student feedback. It's just like what I said before. If we don't know about our students, we, it's hard for us to be inclusive. And then we need to review um, the literature. In terms of considering teaching and learning frameworks, for me, that means, and, and this is me using my context um, strength, when the Clifton strengths inventory, is that I'm thinking like, where did that theory come from? And am I using it in ways that can be, be harmful to my students? For example, we live in a very individualistic culture. A lot of psychology um, that is part of, uh, was part of my doctoral curriculum as well as even my work in a business school, a lot of business or management um, theories are based on psychology. They're based on this notion of individual achievement, individual res responsibility, right? And so do I need to sometimes turn that around to talk about things related to collective responsibility and not just focus on uh, prim or, or privileging individual responsibility within my, my teaching practices? So I would say like, imagine this, imagine a classroom situation uh, where we're talking about uh, maybe plagiarism or something like that. You know, in a business school where very plagiarism has come up for us several times in, um, in one of our areas um, of teaching. And because it's, it's one of those areas where in order for you to become um, certified or licensed, you know, you have to acquire a number of difficult knowledge. Uh, you have to have a very strong knowledge base. And so it lends itself to students that might cheat a little bit more in this particular area of business. And so we like take that idea and say, okay, well, in terms of plagiarism, we're talking, think about plagiarism from an individualistic perspective. We're thinking about it as, okay, you did something wrong student and that there needs to be some sort of punishment. But what if we began to look at plagiarism from a community perspective that we are collectively responsible for what students do and how might that, how might that change our teaching practices? So that's just one example. We want to maintain awareness of classroom diversity, like who's in our classroom. You know, there are indivisible or indivisible, excuse me, invisible <laughs> identities that show up in the, the classroom, right, that we may not know. We may not know how our students identify according to gender or according to their sexual orientation or even according to their race because certain um, quote unquote visible identities may not um, be what we, what people may not be what we think they are based on our own biases and, and preconceptions and misconceptions. We want to incorporate diversity into the curriculum. Who are we talking about in our curriculum? Are we always drawing from research that was done by white men, older white men or dead white men? You know, are we drawing from other voices in our teaching practices? Cultivating an inclusive climate. Again, are we asking our students about their knowledge and what they're bringing into, in, into the classroom? And how does that knowledge either kind of adhere to what we're teaching or how does it sometimes go against what, what, what they're teaching and how do we incorporate these alternative narr narratives or counter narratives in, in our teaching? And so I have a slide on, um, again, wait, hold on for before, before we go a little bit further than this. I'm gonna come back to universal design in a minute, but I do want you, if you haven't, to download the inclusive teaching strategies reflecting on your practice. I put a link to it within the chat. And according to this worksheet, it talks about uh, at least four different, well, four different areas, content, instructional practices, instructor student interactions, and student to student interactions. I want you to take a look at the sheet and I want you to check where your strengths are in terms of content, instructional practices, uh, instructor-student interactions, 
and student to student interactions. And then I also want you to consider after you identified your strengths in those areas, what areas do we need to work on in terms of those four areas? Where do you feel like that you need to put more of your energy into when it comes to your content or your instructional practices or interactions with your students or encouraging student to student interaction. Okay, let me, I'm gonna come back to this in a second. I'm gonna jump to universal design for learning and then I'm gonna come back. One of the areas that you know that, that's, that Sam and Audrey were talking about before in the chat is universal design for learning. If you are not familiar with this framework, I encourage you to become more familiar with it because basically it considers how the brain affects learning and how we can design for students of various um, of students of, of students of, of various students from various backgrounds, basically. And so when we're talking about universal design, we're talking about how can we as educators provide multiple means for engagement for our students in order to motivate them? How can we provide multiple means of representation? And how can we um, provide multiple means of action and expression? And so in terms of multiple means of engagement, do we provide, um, do we provide content or do we provide activities in our course that allow students for to make, to use their individual choice and autonomy. So in terms of our uh, activities, do we have multiple types of activities and we tell students which ones that they can, uh, that they can actually complete and which ones they don't have to complete and let them make that choice. Or another way that I've used uh, multiple means of engagement is in my readings. So I might in a, in a module, in a weekly, weekly module might provide six different uh, resources or research articles for my students and tell them to pick two or three, the ones that resonate with them the most, and then talk about those in the discussion for that week. So that kind of provides that individual choice and autonomy. Providing multiple means of representation, think about ways in which we kind of communicate information. Are we doing it just text? Are we providing video? Are we providing like audio, doing things like podcasts? Uh, how are we providing um, our content to students? And how are our students providing content back to us? So one of the things I did when I was working um, on my doctorate and with, with Dr. Pam Brown uh, over in the kinesiology department and Dr. Dr. Gill is that I had my students create what these digital stories um, about their experiences related to physical activity. And, you know, and so students could write about issues related to race or, or gender or ability and these stories and that became their, their assignment at their culminating assignment for, for one of the classes that I was teaching. So, and I also gave them the opportunity if you want to write a traditional paper, you can do that too. But I wanted to give them the ability to say, I want to express myself in, in a different way that's just not text-based, what we're typically uh, used to in academia. And then providing multiple means of action and um, expression. So it's like, you know, guiding appropriate goal setting, supporting planning, strategy, and development. And so we are supporting learners to be goal directed um, using multimedia for communication. For example, one of the things that I do in my online courses as a way to also try to increase community is that when students introduce themselves in the discussion boards, I ask them to create a video of themselves. Years ago, I would say, oh, just use just in a hundred or so words, you know, tell me about yourself using text. But now, you know, students can, I really encourage my students to use video to talk about who they are so I can actually see them so other students in the class can see them. So with that said, I am going to jump back to, to uh, talking a little bit about the syllabus. So, Another way to think about inclusive teaching is to think about your syllabus. That's why I like to start with when um, with any class, you know, syllabus is kind of, you know, the student's Bible, if, you, if we want to use that term. Um, 
but it's basically their go-to. We always start with the syllabus. And so one of the things I like to include in the syllabus is the diversity inclusion and counter, uh, counter power statement to talk to them about non-discrimination and, and teaching practices and also provide them with uh, campus resources related to issues of, of harassment or related to issues of mental health, like the University Counseling Center, like the Title IX officer, like UNCG police. I also like to include a land acknowledgement statement in the syllabus. It's important, I think, for, for us to acknowledge that the lands that we are on <laughs> were not our, our that we are, that we that we came to this country, that there are already people here, and that is important to uh, acknowledge the indigenous populations on the lands that we are currently on. So I also include that in my syllabus. I also include a health and wellness statement to overemphasize. I include this a little bit in a counter power statement, but to overemphasize the importance of physical and mental health and encourage my students to use the Student Health Center uh, when necessary. So I include a health and wellness statement. So I encourage um, you, if, if you would like to like use these statements in, in your syllabus. And when, if you, I teach mostly online, but uh, if you are teaching online like myself uh, to you know, cover this in the course overview video at the beginning of the semester, or if you're teaching face-to-face -to, -face, to talk about this, these issues on the first day of class and point them out because students are not typically used to these types of statements in, in the syllabus. Okay, and I know that we're kind of, okay, we're just at the 1230 mark, so that's good. We only have a, only have a couple more slides and then we can have a discussion. So mid-course evaluations, uh, this is something I like to use to solicit student feedback. Even though I'm calling it mid-course evaluation, it doesn't necessarily have to be done mid-course. You might do it four weeks into semester where you might ask the students what's going well, what needs to be changed. You might ask them um, questions related to you know, the content and how they're thinking about the content and how, how it's related to their previous knowledge that they have um, uh, attained in other courses and, and, all, and all of that. So you can do this more than once a semester. You can use Canvas to um, the survey feature in Canvas to, to get some anonymous feedback um, related to how your students are feeling and, and the pulse that, on, that they're, where they're at basically at the moment, especially during this time of, of COVID. The last thing that, um, that we, we talk about when it, when it comes to inclusive teaching is what um, Yale's Teaching and Learning Center called reviewing the literature. And so it's important for us in our teaching practices to think about two different things, at least in my opinion. One, are we keeping up with what's out there on our personal level? and on a professional level. So these are some of the books that I have recently read or are currently reading. The Teaching and Learning Center has a literary circle. And so last semester we read, We Will Not Cancel Us and Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. I love both of those books. Uh, I was particularly um, enchanted with We Will Not Cancel Us because it talks about the harm of cancel culture because that's becoming so prevalent these days. Uh, I'm also reading How to Be an Inclusive Leader because when I teach a leadership course for the School of Business, and so one of the things I want to overemphasize with my students is that, you know, it's important for us to be inclusive as leaders. Uh, and then the other two books are something that I'm just starting to read just based out of interest. Um, one is on Indigenous masculinities and the other one is even uh, Kendi's stamp from the beginning was basically is a history of, of race, racist ideas in America. The last thing I will say on this particular topic, and then we can open it up for questions and discussion, is that use the resources here on campus. Uh, University Teaching and Learning Commons has a great web page related to inclusive teaching, pedagogy, pedagogy, and the curriculum. And so 
like I said, I participated in the literary circles. There's also an EDI Institute. There are diversity EDU training modules. Um, and the other thing that's not listed on here, but I think should be listed on here is the, um, the inventory um, that um, the, the strengths inventory, the Clifton strengths inventory that is. And so, because again, I, after taking that, it really opened my mind up to the, to the person, to who I am and the thing and the strengths that I tend to use. And then maybe some of the strengths that I don't use as much. So I encourage you to visit UTLC's webpage to learn more about what's going on here at what's, what's going on here on campus and incorporate that into your teaching and learning practices. So with that, I know I ran through that very quickly, but are there any questions? There's no questions yet in the chat, but y'all are also welcome to in this discussion portion of it. Turn your cameras on, unmute, um, use the chat, whatever you feel comfortable with. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Maya. So one of the questions I would like to ask, because if it's fine, if, it, if there aren't any questions, one of the questions I would like to, to ask the group is, how are you using inclusive teaching practices in your work? Oh, thank you, Meg. Or is this something that's completely new to you? I do try to use inclusive um, teaching practices. Um, and because I'm in the sciences, it's a it's a little uh, different because we're not, I, I, when I teach mostly freshmen, so it's a lot of content. So mm -hmm. uh, things, things that I do, I mean, I do a lot of those first day things that, that you've been talking about, but um, yeah, I make sure that the images that I show are, are inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that, but that can be challenging because it can be really hard to find photographs that aren't all just white people or all just people of color. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Different, mm -hmm. different ages, different physical abilities that are mixed together in groups, which is what I prefer to show or diverse groups of people that look like the groups of people who are in the, in the classroom. So, but mm -hmm. that's just a small thing, you know, that I'm try to always be conscious of that I'm showing diversity um, when I'm using um, people and photographs as examples. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a very important thing because one of the things I learned during doing my dissertation research is that oftentimes uh, students like their identities to be incorporated in, the te in teaching. And so it's important for us to do that, but there's also times too when we need to sometimes ch challenge that and have them think um, outside the box. But I think that uh, that's like two steps down the road, right? So as educators, we first need to become comfortable with uh, diversity and inclusion and making sure that we are attending to the various um, identities that might be showing up in our work, but at the, at the same time, making sure um, that when we need to, we might privilege certain identities over others when it comes to our teaching and learning practices, you know, particularly voices that have been marginalized or excluded in the past. Okay, anyone? Oh, okay, Sam, I see you like saying, okay, more representation, sample searches. Also using, it's important to use inclusive language. You know, one of my colleagues, was, he and I are doing a, a workshop um, in a couple of weeks. And so we want everyone to register. And so I put gender on the registration form. He says, he says, Rob, can we just take that off? He said, just ask people what their pronouns are. And I thought like, yeah, that's, that's more inclusive. It's like, why force people? And, and, it, and it was like optional. You didn't have to say what your quote unquote gender <laughs> is. Um, but it was one of those things, why even bother asking the question, 
right? I wasn't asking about their race or their sexual orientation or anything else, but it's something that is kind of culturally trained and culturally ingrained in us when we're on registration forms to like separate people out by, by quote unquote, their, uh, sex, their uh, sex or their gender identity. Okay, well, if there aren't any other questions, I guess we can we can wrap it up. <laughs> thank you, Audrey. And thank you for everyone who, um, who attended. Is there anything, oh, Sam, you want to say something? No, I dropped the assessment in the chat. I will also include the assessment in the follow-up email with the recording, which you will get either this afternoon or tomorrow uh, at some point. Um, feel free to follow up with Rob. Um, and this is the last one for the series. We just kind of do them on demand as people um, have ideas about online learning and innovation. Uh, but be sure to talk to your academic ITC about a lot of this stuff as well. Um, and uh, I hope everyone has a great day. Happy uh, Thursday. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Take care, everyone. Thank you.